class where there would be more. Uh, welcome everybody to the 144th consecutive PDA town hall and welcome for the people who've been on the, um, the, uh, uh, the town hall already for a few minutes to the closest we come to Groundhog Day as I repeat exactly what I said three minutes ago. <laughs> So um, welcome to PDA Town Hall 144. Today our guest is John Nichols, and uh, we'll be getting to John in about 10 or 12 minutes, everybody. And of course, the subject um, is, uh, given the events of this past week, uh, pretty clear and uh, understandable, which is that we will look back at the results. And as we always do, given when we look back, what, how does it inform how we move forward as a progressive movement, um, as PDA, as a society. So John Nichols will be coming up shortly. Um, and first, let me see if Mike Fox is with us. Has Mike returned with us? Uh, I imagine that's a shake of the head no. And if not, then let's go to Dr. Bill Honigman. And Dr. Bill Honigman will give us our weekly update on the COVID-19 pandemic and all of its uh, social and political subtext. Take it away, Dr. Bill. Thanks so much, Alan. Can you hear me okay? We sure can, loud and clear. All right. Uh, I just posted the stats for uh, COVID, uh, what we call our reality check or weekly reality check uh, in the chat on the Zoom. So uh, hello again, everyone. I'm Bill Honigman, he, him, retired emergency room physician and PDA healthcare issue team leader from unceded Tongva and Keys land in Orange County, California, with a brief update on the ongoing COVID-19 healthcare crisis for this Sunday, November 13th, 2022. As was mentioned, this is now our 144th consecutive weekly PDA online Sunday town hall that began when COVID-19 first hit the US in the spring of 2020. And once again today, sadly, we must report that the United States continues as the world leader among nations in total number of confirmed deaths due to the coronavirus. The Harvard University Daily Tracking Center is reporting the U.S. COVID-19 total death toll today at 1,070,729, which means according to the Lancet Commission report of 2021, that an estimated 428,291 Americans have now died from COVID-19 unnecessarily and would still be alive today if we had a system of universal health care like single payer expanded and improved Medicare for all. Specifically, that's an estimated 765 more Americans whose COVID-19 deaths just as we could have been prevented but weren't thanks to status quo politicians and their wealthy corporate contributors refusing the will of the people to have universal health care where all the people get all the care. This week, world new cases and death rates due to COVID-19 continued at relatively low levels, but with plateauing still in the US and Russia and some increasing numbers in South Korea and Japan, and this week also rising numbers in Italy and Brazil. Our world in data.org is reporting now that only a stagnant 68.2% of the world population have received at least one dose of the COVID-19 vaccine with only 23.6% of those who happen to live in low income countries, primarily the global south, having received even a first dose of a COVID-19 vaccine so far. The US still has only 69.1% of its population with a completed initial series. And the Johns Hopkins Resource Center, which ranks countries by percentage COVID-19 vaccinations as first dose only this week, has the US again at number 50, five zero in this category, just behind Tuvalu at Panama and just ahead of Kuwait and Belgium. And the US worst state for COVID-19 vaccination continues to be Wyoming. Again, this week tied with Alabama at only 52, 0.6% of their respective populations fully vaxxed, live free and die early, red states. This week, the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services extended the public health emergency status for the COVID-19 pandemic for another 90 days. This is the 12th such extension since the PHE was first 
issued in January of 2020, and the designation allows for improved telehealth, fast-track vaccines and treatment, and preserved coverage specifically for millions of Medicaid beneficiaries nationwide. And this in the context of more dominance now due to the Omicron so-called escape variants, notably now BQ1 and BQ1.1, are now believed to account for more than 40% of COVID-19 cases, according to the CDC, and notably as well, flu more generally, and RSV, especially in children, are now causing critical shortages in emergency bed capacity across the country. Also, the CDC reports the rate of flu vaccinations are down, whether due to anti-vax sentiment or lower capacities at pharmacies, and other healthcare facilities due to staffing of personnel shortages created by the strain to the system or to their corporate bottom line of COVID-19. One such breaking point has created a looming strike once again by nurses in California against HMO BMF Kaiser Permanente. This time it's the California Nurses Association at uh, Kaiser facilities impacting some 21,000 nurses in Northern California and about 1,200 nurses at the Los Angeles Kaiser Permanente Medical Center specifically, calling for the workplace action on November 21 and 22. According to a statement from CNA just two, uh, three days ago, they are primarily striking to protest, quote, a refusal to address their ongoing concerns about health, workplace health and safety and chronic short staffing, end quote. Sounds like a resource and systems financing issue to me. Do you think Kaiser's corporate bottom line is interfering with their model of healthcare maintenance? Absolutely. And do you think improved and expanded Medicare for all will eliminate that kind of wasteful and abusive resource allocation? Hell, yes, it will. With the midterms now behind us and more COVID-19 and other public health threats ahead of us, it's time to refocus on getting the people what they want and need, healthcare as a human right, and Medicare for all. Thanks and onward. Thank you so much, Dr. Bill. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't add at this moment, and I see Mike Fowler is here, and PADACA, our California State PAC, its steering committee voted unanimously on Friday to support um, the strike that will be the largest strike in the history of American academia if it commences tomorrow, if a settlement is not reached with UC academic workers. And uh, if any of you are close to uh, people who are graduate students or their lecturers, the level of labor exploitation there is incredibly profound. And so it's a very, very important strike for US higher education going forward and for the labor movement in general. 48,000 workers are poised to go out tomorrow and the vote was 98% in support of it with 36,000 people voting in the strike vote. So that's going on in California and we have full solidarity with the workers, the academic workers of the University of California system. Um, and um, with that, I am, I actually need to do what Mike Fox does for a second. And I know there are many things we talk about. Let's right now though put, clicking on the YouTube link and the uh, liaison signups and then the phone bank signups on the side and let you know too that we are going to be deploying resources from within the state of Georgia in the runoff. And so if uh, folks, Jim and Mike and Danette can place into the chat the link to donate to PDA, um, everything that we raise right now that is above and beyond our standard monthly costs, which will be basically what we raise today, will go towards our efforts in Georgia. We will be having a call probably in 10 days time, which will focus specifically on that. Well, we gotta get mobilizing in these 10 days, as we all know. I'll say more about Georgia at the top of the hour when I make this appeal again, but if we can put that link into the chat and people can give what they can, we are going to make a full on effort to bring home a victory for Senator Warnock. And we are going to focus on the necessity of, uh, again, addressing democracy in this country and the need for us to codify the kind of voting rights that need to be codified by the U.S. Senate, by the House of Representatives, and signed into law at the federal level, and how Raphael Warnock over this next six years 
will be as important a leader on that issue as anyone in the entire country. He took a leadership in the Senate already on the issue. So please give what you can. We um, are coordinated with a great set of people in Georgia. Uh, they run the operation called the Georgia Way, the Atlanta and Georgia NAACP, who we're coordinated with. They're, of course, nonpartisan. So please give what you can. And uh, we who are not nonpartisan and have endorsed uh, Senator Warnock, please give what you can. Uh, and the links are in the chat. Thank you so much. And with that, I am very, very, very happy to introduce, before we get to John Nichols, Donna Smith, who is the chair of the PDA Advisory Board. Donna, welcome. Thank you so much, Alan, and thank you to everybody who's on this call. I know we're all anxious to hear from John. First of all, I, I think I need to apologize to all of you for Lauren Boebert in, our, <laughs> in Colorado. Um, darn it, and early on, we really thought she was gonna get whooped and she was gonna be gone, and it doesn't look that way at this point, but we are very happy with the outcome of the election generally in the state of Colorado. Uh, our, our new congressional district, the eighth, has seated a Democrat, which is great. Great, uh, Dr. Carveo will be a great supporter of all things uh, that we feel are important. Progressively, we'll have to push her a bit, but that's okay. Um, we can do that. We did reelect our governor, uh, Jared Polis, who is um, he had been a single payer supporter, and I'm very happy about what he's done so far with healthcare in the state of Colorado. I think I can uh, speak for all of us. We held our breath, a lot of us, uh, on Monday to wonder what was going to happen on Tuesday, but we kept ourselves working. Even those of us who couldn't do quite as much as Mike Fox does, yay, Mike Fox, he is a force of nature uh, for all of us, those of you who don't know that. Uh, Mike is really something extraordinary who keeps so much going for PDA and I'm so proud to have him as a friend. But let's get on with this. I wanna hear from John Nichols. I know Alan's gonna do a further in introduction but I've known John for many years uh, since the times of uh, our, our wonderful leader, Tim Carpenter and Steve Cobble and all the, I, to listen to the three of them sit and talk politics was a joy beyond belief and a gift to me in my life. So thank you so much. And there's so much more to come for we progressives. I think we can take the energy that has come from this election and really move forward if we work together and we think smart. So back to you, Alan, thanks so much. I think back to Alan. <laughs> ah, there's John, that's good. John is a good thing to have speaking. Uh, John, um, maybe you can just uh, give us give us a little preview of what you think about what's happened. Well, I'm, I'm wondering what happened to Alan. I guess that would I be my, my first question there. Uh, <laughs> yes. I think he's supposed to introduce me, but I think also- He is supposed to introduce you. And I won't have all the glowing details other than the nation. <laughs> you would know more, than, you know more than enough. <laughs> Here he comes. He just got kicked out. He's back. Okay. Oh, excellent. Excellent, Alan. We're waiting for your glowing intro of John. Um, and my brain is not quite back on, on track here. So, Alan, if you're there, it's yours. Hmm. No, he's there. You still see him, Danette? I I'm do, back. but... Um, there he is. Here I is. hear him. There he is. All right. Can you all hear me? Yes. Yes, yes telling them my, my internet connection is unstable, which is uncommon, but thanks to the spectrum monopoly in my house. Boy, this is quite, a, it's an epidemic here for us PDA staffers having trouble with our connections today. Well, I'm back. And actually, I will give a more, uh, maybe as I reintroduce John, since I've uh, been a little disoriented in the past minute with losing my connection, a more proper introduction at the top of the hour when I reintroduce John. All I need to say at the top right now is I say, John, take it away. John Nichols is his preeminent an analyst of American politics as anyone alive today. Um, he has an incredibly uh, brilliant historical grasp on American politics and just uh, an unrivaled perspective on the institutional dynamics of American society and how they relate specifically to the subject of today, American electoral politics, what we learned from Tuesday, where we stand right now, and how we as a progressive movement go forward. And with that, John Nichols, please. Take it away. Well, thanks, Alan. I really appreciate the introduction. You're always very generous, and, and Donna as well. Uh, and uh, I will begin simply by saying that I'm always glad to be with PDA after an election. 
And it doesn't matter whether it's been a good election or a bad election, because I know that the folks in PDA are just going to keep on fighting. In fact, I know of no organization that is actually less concerned by the results than PDA. That doesn't mean that PDA doesn't care. I think PDA probably cares more than any other group, but less concerned because when I say that, I mean, whatever plays out in an election, I have found that PDA, activ PDA activists are ready to start the next day organizing for the next election, the next fight. And that's what makes it a very special organization in politics. The crisis in American politics is that too many of our political groupings come together for an election and then disappear as soon as the election is done. Uh, they unravel uh, whether whether they've won or not. And this has created a real uh, challenge in American politics because we don't have that ongoing steady commitment that is issue-based, that is based on a set of values and ideals rather than just the candidate of the moment. And that is the vision that Tim Carpenter outlined uh, back in 2004 with Steve Cobble and Donna Smith coming on quickly and, and a whole bunch of other folks, many folks who are on this call today uh, and recognize the need for a group that did that. I would just say that uh, this has been a very exciting week that we've just been through, and I'll talk about that in a moment, but also a somewhat, I will actually say heartbreaking week for me because uh, this is the first major election that uh, I haven't been able to call Steve Cobble uh, on election day and on the day after the election and uh, talk with him just about you know whatever was happening, whatever was coming in, all the information. Uh, Steve always had the, the most astute analysis and he always brought it back to the work that PDA was doing. And uh, I, I have not gotten over his passing uh, it will. I, I know that because on Tuesday of this week, as we were all anxiously waiting to see what happened in the election, uh, I literally found myself longing to call Steve Cobble, uh, and uh, and certainly also longing, you know, in a somewhat longer sense for Tim Carpenter. So honors to the great founders of this group and and all the other people that have been involved along the way, keeping it alive, keeping it strong. Uh, I'm so glad that Alan is uh, has taken a leadership role because I think he does a fantastic job and, and I think you're lucky to have him, but I think he's also lucky to have all of you. And I see if I'm correct that we have someplace in the range of 400 people on this call, which is a great testament to the organization and, and to your strength and, and vibrancy, not just in particular bases, but really nationwide. So let's talk about the election. Uh, and I think the the important thing to say is to acknowledge up front that pundits are terrible people to uh, talk to after an election because they always will tell you how they knew certain things were coming. Uh, and I'm going to admit to you right up front that this election surprised me. In fact, this election is exactly why I love politics, why I love covering politics, why I love being around it, because I love an election that I thought was going to be you know difficult or bad or really disappointing. That turns out to be good. I mean, it's it's a it's a rare and wonderful thing, and um, and that's what happened this time. If we had gotten together a week ago uh, and been talking on the Sunday before the election, I can tell you the tenor of this conversation. There would have been a general sense that it was going to be awful, and it was just a question of how awful. Uh, you know, would the how badly would the Democrats lose the House? How uh, would they lose the Senate? And if so, how badly? How many governorships would they lose? How many election denial secretaries of state would be elected? You know, how much would the, the struggle for economic and social and racial justice for uh, peace and for saving the planet be set back by the results? And uh, so we went into the election. Uh, I can tell you before the election, I was generally in the camp that, uh, that Democrats had a chance to hold the Senate. Um, I, I at least had that much uh, sense. Uh, but I certainly thought that Republicans would take the House by probably a reasonably substantial margin. And I also uh, saw a lot of danger in the states all over, all over the country. What did we get? Well, pretty much the opposite of what, what people feared. Um, this was the best midterm election cycle for a newly elected Democratic president, i.e. for a Democratic president in the second year of his first term since Franklin Roosevelt in 1934. 
Now pause and take that in. The best midterm election we've seen since the New Deal era elections, which were the elections that really created the modern Democratic Party and framed it out in the mind of most Americans. And I don't want to tell you that this was a parallel election to that 1934 election. In 1934, Franklin Roosevelt and the New Deal Democrats, as well as their allies to the left, because at that time we actually had something much more akin to multi-party democracy. So they had allies in the Wisconsin Progressive Party, the Minnesota Farmer Labor Party, the North Dakota Nonpartisan League, and other left groupings across the country. They actually significantly increased their position in the House, the Senate, the governorships, and legislatures across the country. In fact, in those days, they still had a whole bunch of allies who were members of the Socialist Party that were in elected positions. So it was a different time. And the Great Depression, obviously, a different time than now. But when we have to go back to that point to find our comparisons, right? And the only other one being 1962 for a newly elected Democratic president, John Kennedy in the midst of the Cuban Missile Crisis, that means something big happened on Tuesday. It was a significantly different election than the pollsters, the pundits, and frankly, I think most of us imagined was coming. And there's a couple of things to put in play as of where we're at right now. Last night, if you stayed up late enough in, in the, on the East Coast, uh, Democrats clearly took the United States Senate. This will be a Democratic Senate for the next two years. Uh, that in itself is an incredibly significant thing. Understand that we're, we didn't end up in the situation that Barack Obama ended up in in the last part of his presidency, that Bill Clinton ended up in through much of his presidency. So you have a Democratic president now who has got, for, guaranteed for his whole first term, a Democratic Senate. What that means is that despite the realities of Joe Manchin and Kirsten Sinema, Democrats have the ability to approve Supreme Court justices, should an opening come, to approve federal court justices, and they to approve cabinet appointments, ambassadors, all sorts of, a lot of things can be done simply by having a majority in the Senate, even if you've got the frustrations of Manchin and Sinema. You also have a negotiating position as regards the House. And if the Republicans had taken the House and the Senate, then it would be congressional negotiating against the White House. Now you have a whole secondary position there, whereas the White House puts its position down, a Democratic White House, and then you have a Democratic Senate, Republican House potentially, uh, negotiating and, and wrestling with one another. It's a much stronger position to be in, especially for many of the issues that we care about, uh, saving Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, which was genuinely threatened if Republicans took full control, uh, many of the, maintaining many of the environmental initiatives that have been done. So a lot comes from just getting the Senate. And Democrats don't just have the Senate. They may, if Georgia comes through, have a clear majority, not 50-50 with Kamala Harris breaking the tie, but a 51-49. A 51-49 is exponentially different and better. It's a much different deal. I think someone's chatting with us here. But uh, it's a much bigger deal than uh, just having a 50-50. And I'll tell you why. Because despite all the frustrations with Manchin and Cinema, um, those two members are different. They are not exactly the same. And they do go together on many issues, but there are other issues that they don't go together on. And so if you've got one more Democrat there, especially a Democrat like Raphael Warnock, uh, you end up in a situation where you have much more of a possibility of isolating a mansion or a cinema individually and then still getting to fit with Kamala Harris breaking that tie. So that additional member is a huge deal. And, and that's why the Georgia fight becomes absolutely essential for the Democrats, much more important than I think uh, than I think a lot of people understand. If you understand the dynamics of how the Senate works and the dynamics of how Senate negotiates with the House, getting to that 51 is a big deal. Now let's take us down to the House itself. And this is the most amazing thing about our conversation, or at least the second most amazing. We'll get to the third in a second. Uh, but this is really an amazing thing. Uh, it is the Sunday afternoon after an election. We are the better part of a week after an election, and Kevin McCarthy does not have a majority. That is a striking thing. Uh, and you know, Kevin McCarthy had a, uh, a event on you know, very, overnight on 
late Tuesday, early Wednesday, where he announced that they had won, that they were going to do all these things. He made all these claims. And the fact of the matter is that um, the better part of a week has passed and he doesn't have it. And with each passing hour, the likelihood that Republicans get the House becomes a little bit less. I'm still in the camp that thinks that they will get the House. Uh, my sense is that they will have a very, very small majority, uh, potentially as low as two or three seats, you know, and very possibly under five. And so that's amazing that it's it's that close. But there is still probably a 20, 25 percent chance that Democrats could actually keep the House. It depends on how a handful of races in California and some other states go, uh, maybe some recounts that this could drag out for a long time. But the closeness of the result means that the Republicans cannot begin organizing the House in the way that they would have been able to if they had had a clear 20, 25 seat majority. And also it means that Kevin McCarthy becomes a uh, kind of a, a, a kept man, so to speak. He is in a very, very difficult position because if he's got a two or three seat majority, what that means is that on any given bill, if the Freedom Caucus, Marjorie Taylor Greene, folks like her, uh, decide to break with him, he doesn't have his majority anymore. And also, if he goes too close to the Freedom Caucus, Marjorie Taylor Greene, et cetera, then he runs the risk of losing a handful of mostly Northeastern, conservative, but relatively more moderate members, some of whom are pro-labor. Remember when the PRO Act was there, you got the better part of a half dozen Republicans voting with the Democrats in favor of the PRO Act. You still have a handful of pro-choice Republicans. Uh, and on environmental issues, it's very intriguing. You've actually got a, a relatively modest but, but credible group of Republicans who are at least acknowledging climate crisis and want to work on it. So uh, there is just a real problem for Kevin McCarthy holding together a clearly conservative right-wing majority here and a lot of room for uh, a Democratic White House, a Democratic Senate to pick off some Republicans on critical votes. So a lot of things come from that narrow prospect. Obviously, if Democrats have the House, then all sorts of things become possible. But if they don't have the House, but it's a narrow margin, still dramatically better than if it was 10, 20 seats. Now, this is where we get to the best part of all. Uh, the results from the states are stunning. I mean, it is, it is important to understand that this is the first time in the modern era that a political party that holds the White House has had significant advances in the states. The Democrats did not suffer setbacks in the governor's races. It looks like they will pick up at least two governorships, uh, maybe probably a third with Arizona, and they're going to have a potential setback in Nevada, but they still come out with a net gain probably of two governorships, and that's not the end of it. If you go down ballot, there was a blue sweep uh, in races for secretary of state, and this is where the real election denial issue comes into play. Well, you take a look across the country in critical race after critical race, the candidate who, the Democratic candidate, who said that they would protect elections, fair and free elections, won. And they won in a number of red states or, you know, purple states. And so across the battleground states of the country, and remember, the core battleground states of the country in 2020 were Wisconsin, Michigan, Pennsylvania, Georgia, and Arizona. Well, in every one of those states, the Secretary of State is going to be a supporter of free and fair elections. Everyone, because you know, in Georgia, you have a Republican, but one who is sympathetic there. Also in the state of Nevada, another key swing state, you're going to have a supporter of free and fair elections as Secretary of State. That's an incredible win. It's also an incredible shift from what we had or what we anticipated you know, going into this election. Uh, also in the legislatures, the Democrats have shifted uh, a number of legislatures, we don't know how many it'll end up. It's not going to be a massive number, but it'll be three or four uh, where they've literally won chambers, in some cases won uh, a trifecta control of the state. That's going to be hugely important for codifying Roe v. Wade at the state level. Uh, and they have uh, had you know, significant progress just in their numbers across the country. In no case, in no case did the Republicans flip a chamber that I know of yet, and if it pattern holds, where they flipped a chamber to their side. That is unprecedented. 
in a midterm election of this kind. So incredible lot of good news there and, and things to actually celebrate, to, to be excited by. But I have to tell you, and if we're honest with ourselves, and PDA, I think above all political groupings is an honest grouping. It's a group that, that recognizes the realities of politics. If we're honest with ourselves, we have to admit that this is still a status quo election, right? Because we went into this election afraid of horrible things happening, losing a lot of ground, moving backward on all sorts of issues. That did not happen. But we did not substantially move forward, except in a couple of states. I'll get Michigan substantially moved forward. A couple of states clearly did. But nationally, we're still essentially in a status quo position, maybe even a somewhat weakened position, because if Republicans have the House, it simply becomes more difficult to for the Biden administration to, to manage on a host of issues, particularly budget issues. And, and so it's essentially a status quo election. We didn't move forward on a whole bunch of issues. And that's, that's a challenging reality because there are so many issues that we need to work on. I mean, understand, we're, we've got 400 years of structural racism to address. We have uh, economic inequality that is scorching uh, to address. We have a climate crisis that you know, literally with each passing hour, we get closer to the point where we can't deal with it. We have a military industrial complex that is literally eating up massive portions of our budget without a realistic challenge to it. The old PDA uh, slogan, healthcare, not warfare, remains as true as ever. Uh, but, you know, the reality is that that Pentagon budget keeps going up. So we've got a lot of challenges that are not going to be addressed in this new moment or at least not addressed at the level that they should be. And so it is a status quo election. And we have to, I think we have to accept that, um, that in some cases, progress has actually become harder at the federal level. So much to celebrate about the actual results, much to recognize about the politics of this situation. And I think it's important when we are in a situation like this to understand why can't we get that big leap forward, that, that real progress? And it's because of some of the structural failures that that I, you know, I think we have to recognize. And those structural failures are often in the elites of the Democratic Party. And the fact of the matter is, could the Democratic Party have won two or three more Senate seats this time? Yes, there is simply no question. I come from the state of Wisconsin. In the state of Wisconsin, Mandela Barnes, a progressive candidate, uh, lost by 26,000 votes out of 2.6 million cast. I'm gonna repeat that, 26,000 votes out of 2.6 million cast. He's not a Republican, so he conceded because he had lost. But the fact of the matter is it was a painful, heartbreaking loss for, for a lot of folks in Wisconsin, and it didn't have to happen. Mandela Barnes was attacked by a racist and xenophobic campaign in September and early October. He was outspent by roughly $10 million. Understand that $10 million in a relatively small state. And that 10 million went into an advertising campaign that blitzed the airwaves, calling the first black candidate for the US Senate nominated by a major party in Wisconsin, dangerous and different. Literally trying to other him in the same way they did Barack Obama when Obama was coming up politically. It was an incredibly ugly campaign and tragically it succeeded. But if the Democrats had had the resources in Wisconsin in September and October, Mandela Barnes would not have been knocked down as far as he did in that period. He wouldn't have had to climb up, you know, that hill that was created by the, all those attack ads. He would have won. There is simply no question of that. And so Democrats strategically at the national level failed to make the steps, get the resources in the right places at the right time. And I would argue that something similar happened with Sherry Beasley down in North Carolina, another race that could have been won, but the resources weren't there, the targeting wasn't right. And frankly, national Democrats fell for the oldest trick in the book. Republicans flooded the zone with fake polls, or at least, if not fake polls, biased polls. Those polls seemed to suggest that Democratic incumbents were in trouble, people like Maggie Hassan and Patty Murray. So a lot of resources went to those states. The resources didn't go to that forward push to elect more Democrats to Senate seats. It was a big strategic error by the people who run the, the Senate Democratic campaigns and they should know better. They're paid to know better. And so it's one of those lessons for a group like PDA that you, know, you should 
recognize that your grassroots activism is often more in touch, more close to the reality of where things are than that of the highly paid strategists and the pollsters and all the, the elites in DC. And I'll give you uh, another example, just one more example on this. In house races, there is now, as we look at it, and of course this is hindsight to some extent, but remember, you would expect the strategists to be a little better at this. There is simply no question that if Democrats had put their money in the right places and put their energy in the right places, they could unquestionably have kept the house. Now they may yet dumb luck into keeping the house as it is, but they could clearly have kept it. They pulled money out of rural districts. Uh, and I'll give you the example again from my state of Wisconsin in the third congressional district, which is Western Wisconsin. It's a democratic held seat now. It became an open seat. In early October, the Democrats at the national level pulled all their money out. The Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee didn't put a penny into that campaign. The Democratic PACs didn't put money into that campaign. And yet Brad Pfaff, the Democratic candidate, a, a farm rural populist running on a lot of good issues, Brad Pfaff ended up being outspent by $5 million by a four to one ratio he was outspent. And yet he got more than 48% of the vote. He actually ran better than some of the frontline targeted Democrats. And if he had simply had the resources, had he had you know, a little more focus on his race, there is no doubt he could have won that seat. Now I'm gonna tell you something, if control of the house comes down to one seat, I can point exactly to where Democrats could have had it. And that's not the only race. As I look around the country, I find a number of those races, particularly in rural areas. It's clear the Democrats don't have a, their head wrapped around how to do rural organizing and rural and kind of small city organizing. And it is costing them severely. Uh, and it's something that the PDA should be focused on. The last thing I'll say in this regard is that uh, the Democrats suffered a great deal in this cycle from a lack of a coherent message. Now, they had a message that worked, and let's be clear, and that is we're not the Republicans. And at this point, people are so afraid of a Republican party moving toward authoritarian, in some cases, neo-fascist stances on issues, embracing you know, Viktor Orban and the new leader in Italy, um, you know, going all the way down the line on Trumpism, running campaigns that are, you know, clearly racist and xenophobic. I mean, yeah, it's, it is, you know, in, in that situation, it, it is somewhat valid simply to say you're not that. But as regards having a clear and coherent message on inflation and saying inflation is bad, it's real, Democrats have a plan. That plan is to go after price gouging corporations and have that be a central message through the whole campaign. Having as a second tier message, that Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, America's social welfare underpinning is as weak as it is, and while we want Medicare for all, et cetera, is genuinely threatened. Republicans literally said they wanted to go after Social Security. Um, that should have been upfront and a central part of the message. Obviously, choice had to be a part of the message, and democracy had to be a part of the message, and it should have been all together in a coherent focus. It shouldn't have been, you know, oh, well, maybe we'll focus on this this week, maybe we'll focus on that that week. And so a lack of a coherent message, something that PDA actually understands, because PDA has fought harder than just about any group in the country to have a coherent message. Um, you saw that there was a danger there, and, a, and I think it was problematic for the Democrats. Again, they did well. There's much to celebrate. I'm not here trying to rain on the parade, but I am telling you that could it have been much better? Could you actually have started to approach what you saw in 1934 with Roosevelt? Not merely preventing horrible things from happening, but actually moving in a much more positive direction. I think the reality is pretty clear that it is possible. And so what this tells me, and this is actually the place where I close off, um, you know, the need for a group like PDA is greater than ever. Uh, because Democrats, they can win in major elections because the Republicans are so frightening and because the threat is so real. But that is not enough to actually move the country toward economic and social and racial justice, toward peace, toward saving the planet, toward priorities that are in order. And to get to that, there has to be grassroots groupings that say to the elites of the Democratic Party, look, you're not getting this right. You're not understanding how to do this. You're still putting way too much money into television advertising, way too little into grassroots organizing. You're still putting way too much of a preference 
on the side of centrist candidates rather than exciting progressive populists who can go out and energize folks. You are still focused on you know, a narrow vision of what your base is rather than an expansive vision that says that there are millions of voters in inner cities and rural areas and across this country who are not touched by traditional politics. And if you reach out to them, they can actually deliver for you in fundamental ways. That's something PDA understands a lot better than the Democratic National Committee. And so the necessity of this group becomes greater. And I think the way to prove that is simply to look at John Fetterman's race in Pennsylvania. And the fact of the matter is that John Fetterman is, he's imperfect, he's flawed. He's got, you know, you find places you disagree with him. I disagree with him on some issues. But the reality is that John Fetterman ran as a candidate who said, everybody should have health care. And he actually talked about his own circumstance, having a stroke and saying he wants everybody to have the level of care that he got, who said that everybody should have a right to join a union, who said that marijuana should be legalized, who said that criminal justice reform is a good idea and don't run away from it just when because Republicans are yelling about crime. Uh, crime is bad, but criminal justice reform is also something that we need in this country. And who talk on issue after issue after issue on defending choice, on defending democracy in bold, blunt, and aggressive ways. And as he said in the slogan of his campaign, every county, every vote. He took that campaign to places where Democrats don't usually go, to counties and small towns where Democrats don't usually campaign. He found crowds of people, just as PDA has, who are ready to join something different and better. And the results on election day were incredibly striking. John Fetterman upped the Democratic percentage in the in Erie County up in Northwest uh, Pennsylvania, a county that had voted for Trump in 2016. He moved the Democratic percentage up by 10 points, a small city going up by 10 points. And I went across and did, I just did a piece on this for the nation that you can link to. Uh, I went across the, the map of Pennsylvania, rural county after rural county after rural county, John Fetterman upped the Democratic percentage by four, five, six, seven, eight percent, even in Erie County, 10 percent. That is what is possible if you take a progressive populist campaign rooted in many of the values of PDA and you put that forward to people with a candidate who isn't afraid to talk about it. The possibilities are immense. Uh, the potential for a different and better politics is out there. I'm so glad to be spending this Sunday after the election with PDA, and I'm thrilled to take some of your questions or whatever you have to say. Um, thank you, and Stephen Schaff. Hey, Stephen, great to see you, and you'll be first on deck. Um, I have uh, one question, and of course, I would have a thousand. Actually, I was formulating so many questions, and you 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 answered them, so many of them. So it's I, I, it's great having you on as the guest. Um, but um, uh, the question I'll have then does uh, relate to uh, a blog post that I shared with you. Um, uh, yesterday that was posted by Mike Hirsch, our communications director on our website. And I actually just grabbed the URL of John's article and I'll post that again that he mentioned about Fetterman into the chat for everybody right there. And that means I do no longer have what I had ready to share in the chat as a link, which is Mike's blog post. And now I've got that and I'm gonna add that into the chat. So the first question, the question I have for you and then we'll go to the stack is um, obviously, and I'll frame it in a broader way, but go right back to the moment. Um, one of the issues we're going to face is a progressive movement going forward. And let's be honest, Joe Biden was a big winner on, on Tuesday. Yeah. And the likelihood of Biden running again and clearing the field, at least of high profile elected officials competing against him, is very high right now. That means the great spectacle that lifted the progressive movement so spectacularly in 2016 and 2020 may not be on the center stage, not just of the country, but of the world. By the way, one of my talking points in interviews is a, is a fun one, so I'll say it, is that on what, uh, a week from today, the uh, sports spectacle that is often referred to as the thing that brings humanity together more than anything in the world, the World Cup soccer tournament begins in Qatar. Yeah. Well, there's one thing, as you know, that brings the world's attention together even more than the World Cup tournament, men's World Cup tournament, which is the US presidential election. And in the last two cycles, the progressive movement was lifted by the Bernie Sanders campaign to new heights in recent times, certainly in 21st century America, within the electoral political realm. 
you might not have that as something to boost the progressive movement. So that's something to think about going forward over these next two years for PDA. But everything John said is absolutely spot on. We have to keep going, keep building off the platform we have and understand that we won't have that. Probably we won't have something like a Sanders campaign to rally around. Now, to Folks are frozen. I don't know if you can hear me. Donna, you can hear me. I can hear you, I can hear you. Al, Al, Alan. Froze. Yeah, yeah, we need to pitch in and get Alan a better uh, internet connection. Yes. I know. <laughs> it's, uh, it might, in, in as much as he is your, your staff, uh, you know, it might be it might be time to put a buck toward the internet connection. Um, yeah, but I think it was, if it takes him a minute to get back, John, did you get the general drift of where he was going? I, I think I did. Um, but you know, I, I'm always you know, it, it's it's terrible speaker that that tells you what the questioner was really meaning, right? Uh, <laughs> but uh, let's let's play with that a little bit. And you know, what he I think he was bringing us toward a, a little bit of a discussion about where we're going in 2016. Our two. <laughs> This is my how my mind works. I'm still focused on the 2016 campaign, which <laughs> will, to my to my view, still be one of the most glorious campaigns I've ever witnessed. So, uh, uh, but 2024, and so uh, look, it, what Alan says is exactly right. Uh, Joe Biden was immensely strengthened by this election, instead of being weakened as many people thought and being put in a, in a very difficult position. Biden uh, is sort of redeemed here. He's got a Senate he can work with. Uh, he's going to have a House that won't be as bad. Instead of being rendered lame duck, uh, to the extent that his political skills, his historic political skills from being 36 years in the Senate, eight years as vice president, uh, serve him well, um, this, could be, this could be his moment. And so, uh, to my mind, the chances of him uh, being pushed aside are slimmer than ever, right? It, it's unlikely that he gets... Uh, that he gets denied a nomination in 2024. Now, uh, he is not a particularly young fella. Uh, and so there is still the chance that for a variety of reasons, he might decide not to run in 2024. So I think progressives have to be ready for that reality. And you know, organizing is, is uh, I always argue organizing is about 90% you know, getting in place for what might happen, right? It isn't mm -hmm. necessarily organizing to get a result. It's great if you do, right? You know, that long-term building to where you get something. But the reality is that you put a lot of pieces in place and then the moment comes and you're ready. You're more prepared. The establishment is always ready because they always have money and they always have, you know, all their infrastructure. The, the folks who are challenging the establishment, the insurgencies, the, the progressives, the radicals, they, they often don't have things in place. So I think it's valid as you look toward 2024 to say, look, there's, there's, you know, organizing that needs to be done. There's preparation. There's at least a consciousness. You should entertain folks who say they might want to run, you know, I mean, hear, hear them out and, and, and pay attention to it, but recognizing reality. And that's something I think PDA is very good at recognizing reality is that there's a very good likelihood that Joe Biden uh, is the democratic nominee in 2024. Um, that doesn't mean, however, that does not mean, however, that the Democratic Party has to continue to be the Democratic Party as it is today. And as I said in my remarks, and I'll really emphasize that strongly, um, whether it is a, uh, an insurgent candidacy like a, what Bernie Sanders was in 2016, especially in 2020, um, or whether it is a mobilization to make the party uh, recognize some of the things we were just talking about, things have to change. This Democratic Party uh, remains too undemocratic. It doesn't have the avenues in for grassroots activists to you know, really influence its direction. It still, as I said, spends too much time uh, raising money for television, too little time on grassroots organizing. And it still has a bias against grassroots progressive candidates who can win in places uh, where the elites don't understand. Uh, Mandela Barnes would be a senator today if Democrats in Washington had a better understanding of the upper Midwest, and Brad Pfaff as another example would be going to the House if Democrats had a under, better understanding of how to do rural districts. So that um, was PDA to sort some of that out. Alan is back. Excellent. 
Oh uh, yeah, hey, no, and uh, you know, actually, there's a partner organization of ours we partner with a lot called Roots Action that has this "Don't Run Joe" campaign. And my little quip to one journalist uh, a little while ago when it was launched back in the summer was, "Well, PDA, uh, I can't speak for PDA, but my guess is that the base of PDA, like me, wants to see Bernie Sanders inaugurated president on January 20th, 2025." So, in so much as uh, I support Don't Run Joe, of course I do, because Bernie's a person of his word, and Bernie has said he won't run if Joe Biden is running. So that's the situation we have with Bernie, and I um, I think after the results, that's probably going to hold fast and true with Bernie Sanders. But then there are issues, of course, that uh, if Biden, uh, who is old and has had some signs of some health problems here and there, if anything like that turns up, then of course we'll jump right back into it. And And as for what John said, we definitely should be poised to be elevating progressive voices wherever they appear anywhere, uh, honest, sincere voices. Because look, look, the, we've had 40 years of neoliberalism, right? And it has delivered us to a social and political crisis that has been stunning these past few mm -hmm. years. And uh, we need the core causes of that social crisis to be addressed. And the political status quo is not adequately addressing them. And I think the progressive movement is. So we really have to know and really be very agile in how we lift up the progressive movement in every way, shape, or form going forward. Did you address the thing about, did I get to in what I was saying, the issue of, and then I got cut off at Spectrum. So I, don't sorry. worry, you got cut off. What what was, what what are you raising? Well, it was about what Mike posed, uh, Mike Hirsch posed in the blog oh, okay. post. So about, yeah. about a lame duck session um, pressed uh, by progressives to push for the John Lewis Voting Rights Act, yes. out of I wrote. Uh, yeah. Look, I, I, sympathize very much with what Mike has suggested. I think it's it's a wise suggestion. Whether you call it a special session, a, you know, make full use of the lame duck session, whatever phrasing you want to use, the bottom line is that uh, Democrats just had a very, very good result, uh, but a result that may make it difficult to advance legislation after January 3rd because the Republicans might come to control of the House and, and stop action rather than uh, uh you know it isn't just that they would have a majority of people who are against it they just wouldn't bring issues up so i think using this uh this lame duck session to deal with some issues that are universally popular and that has perhaps even some republican support is a a, a very smart move and, and your framing on that would be that look the republicans if they get once they come to power, they're going to just block legislation. They're going to not let things happen. So we want to at least put these issues forward and see where, you know, the play is. Here's an example. Um, let's say that they, uh, you know, pass the PRO Act again. You know, they, they've already done it, but, you know, put it forward, work on some of these democracy issues, at least at the very least, frame it out. I, I mean, I hear all the time from people who wonder what Congress does most of the time, right? And <laughs> so the idea of coming back after in the lame duck session and putting some issues on the table, at least saying, you know, look, we'd like to work with some Republicans here to pass some things, you know, pass the PRO Act, which actually has some Republican support, try and get that over to the Senate. Maybe we can actually still get that through. Um, look at some of these democracy issues. I think what Mike's raising is, is good and creative. Do I think the Democratic Party uh, has that level of uh, energy and flexibility and focus? Um, well, I think that's why PDA exists, is to try <laughs> and get that level of energy and focus. Um, so we are uh, pressed up against the top of the hour. And not only am I back, but Mike Fox is back. Uh, we've had an epidemic of some connectivity problems here with the PDA staffers. Mike, uh, why don't we go to, uh, when I had looked last, Steve and St Schaff was first on stack. It got reconfigured when I came back, but Stephen, you're on deck. And um, but let's go to Mike for the top of the hour to PDA to do's um, with the leaning into we got to raise some money so that we can get our troops out there in Georgia. And then we'll go back for Q&A with John Nichols. So Mike Fox, take it away. Thank you, Alan. Can you hear me? Yeah, I can. The well, wonderful here, world of technology, but this is a perfect example of how we win. We adapt 
we overcome, we get the damn job done. So let's uh, first start with my absolute favorite part of the week, and that is my thank yous. Very quickly, I want to thank the following folks who have donated. Uh, phone banker Andrews, double dipping, uh, Judy, Terry, Ken Kenningus, phone banking and leading. Thank you, brother. And Sally and phone banker Mary and Ken and phone banker Kathy and Linda and Paul and Richard and Nurse Judy, again, as always, thank you for your kind $100, Nurse Judy, uh, phone banker Betsy, James, Carol, Mark, Robert, uh, Mi Chang, phone banker Jane, uh, our leader in Tampa, Linda, thank you, also phone banker, uh, Neil, Gina, phone banker Erica, Arthur, phone banker Aaron, Jean, Shahzad, and Astrid, and Carl, phone banker Carl, not only phone banker, but door knock extraordinaire Carl thank you so much brother and uh, Nadine Loretta Beverly and Jacqueline thank you so much for donating we're about halfway to where we want to get in order to get more boots on the ground in Georgia etc to bring that victory home the other way we're going to bring the victory home I'm going to be tossing the uh donation link here in a second. If actually, if you're on the phone and can't see the chat, go to pdamerica.org and crush that donate uh, button and throw in all that you can. We, uh, we definitely need to bring this home in Georgia. The other way that we're going to do it, and we have been doing it, is by making phone calls from across the country into Georgia. We need a wave going. Already got nine folks signed up. That's a beautiful thing. I want to at least double that before John Lee leaves. So that's uh, pdamerica.org slash volunteer. I'll put the link in the chat as well. Lastly, from a to-do, and then dang, stick with us here for family time. We will revisit these goals and drill down more into specifically what you can do to make a difference. But we're likewise involved in the ballot curing process mm. that's taking place in Arizona in a big way. There's still Judith Whitmer and her crew out in Nevada are still curing ballots right now. All the media saying, oh, this is over, that's over. Nah, they're curing their ballots to bring in votes for folk all, folks all up and down the ballot there. So if you are into making calls to cure ballots, if you don't know what that means, it's just simple. It had a little mistake in it. Vote by mail ballot. The voter has the opportunity to correct that. In Nevada, by the end of the day on Monday, there are some other deadlines. Email me at Mike Fox at pdamerica.org if you want to help in that regard. And integral to that process is in, Cal or in Colorado. We want to be uh, curing all those ballots in Bobert's district. How cool would that be if we could pull that off there? So uh, I'll be back with more on the back end, but back to you, Alan. Thank you so much, Mike. And as promised earlier, I did want to mention a few of John Nichols' books. Um, I absolutely love every one of the books that Mike that John, that that um, John has co-authored with the media critic and just another brilliant analyst, uh, Robert McChesney. It's a whole uh, group of them. I encourage people to look at those. I love the book, The S Word, from 2011, by the way, John. But I want to highlight your two latest books. Second most recent is get this, folks, for a PDA title: The Fight for the Soul of the Democratic Party: The Enduring Legacy of Henry Wallace. A lot of lessons in that book for our moment. And then Coronavirus Criminals and Pandemic Profiteers, John's most recent books, both of those are from Verso Press. And with that, first on deck for a question for uh, John Nichols is my friend, Stephen Schaff. Take it away, Stephen. Hey, everyone. John, it's good to see you again. I have a Pleasure, real quick uh, a comment and then a question for you, John. And uh, when we started this off, uh, Donna uh, Smith had invoked uh, Tim Carpenter and Steve uh, Cobble's names. There were incredibly wonderful uh, political minds. And then when you come into DC and the three of you got together, man, I'm talking about a progressive brain trust. Uh, and for those of you who don't know, I've, I've been very involved with the uh, PDA since the very beginning. I'm the, the official uh, vice chair emeritus, which I'm very proud of. But in the first several years, I was also very uh, lucky and privileged to be in those kind of conversations, which frankly made me more of an expert than I ever could have been just being in an hour or two conversation with the the erudite and very succinct John Nichols and others who really can explain very difficult things in a, in a very quick, easy, 
digestible way. So John, I've always appreciate you. And like you, and with the, when Tim had passed, there are many times where I felt like picking up the phone and say, uh, Steve, I have a, a political question for you in 15 minutes. I know you can give me all the background. And that's really devastating not to be able to do that. And plus, by the way, they're both big baseball fans. So we call on, on those very important topics too. So uh, again, John, you're a very much part of our DNA. Uh, and Tim just adored you. And when Tim adored someone, it's usually because you're a really, really a spectacular person. And you've been uh, very much a champion for PDA. The question I have for you in terms of your comments, uh, where I agree with everything you said, but there was another part too that, I think PDA is beginning to get better at uh, as it's maturing, and that is the uh, young and the uh, people of color uh, vote came out yep. this time, yep. hopefully in a way that will really be substantial in the next uh, uh, several uh, elections. In your opinion, John, how can PDA, a, a traditional progressive, kind of older, more mature, mm -hmm. homogenous organization really tap into uh, that mo momentum? Well, that's a great question, Stephen. Thanks. Now, I want to emphasize, we don't have a lot of time for this Q&A, so I want to make sure that we're, I'll try to be quick. I hope everybody else does too, and we'll try and cover a lot of territory. But Steve put a great issue on the table right up front, and that is youth vote. Uh, here's a, a, a stat for you to take in. Among people over the age of 65, the bias toward the Republicans was 13%. Among people in the range from uh, I think it was 45 to 65. Uh, it was a bias of about 11 percent in the area from 30 to uh, 45. Uh, the bias was for the Democrats by about 2 percent. Now, so if it's all people over 30, uh, the Republicans would have won a landslide, would have been a, just an incredibly big victory. But then people under 30 and disproportionately people in that range from 18 to 25, the bias was 28% in favor of the Democrats. You understand that? That is that is an unimaginable level of support for the Democrats coming out of young voters. If you saw a line of young voters going into a polling place, that was a place where Democrats were going to win. And so what PDA and other groups ought to do is recognize this is a permanent mission, is to get young people to vote. And the key, the hard part is that young people do something that a lot of other, you know, kind of demographic measures don't do. They actually move out of their category, right? Young people get older. And so they're no longer in that, you know, 18 to 25 category. They're no longer into that, in that 18 to 30 category. And so you got always a new group of young people coming in. That makes it harder. And so what PDA and other groups have to do is have it put energy into permanent initiatives based on campuses, based on in high schools, because remember the high schools are moving up. And then finally, based in places of incoming for working class young people who may not be going to a traditional college and that they may be in tech school, they may be going straight to work. And so that's a three tier focus, colleges, colleges, universities, high schools, and then places of incoming for young working class people. And that is, you know, look, that's going to take resources. It's going to take energy. Uh, PDA is not a super wealthy group, right? I understand that. So the key is to find your campuses. Uh, and, you know, I would say to some PDAers who, as somebody said, maybe a little bit more seasoned group, right? Um, <laughs> you've got grandkids. Figure out how to get your grandkids to do the job. Uh, that That is... That is really vital. I cannot begin to emphasize you. Emphasize you. If it wasn't for the youth vote this time, we wouldn't be having an upbeat call today. And so, for PDA, uh, you need to have. I would say, literally, set up a strategy group that is focused solely on how to get young people to vote, and put energy, resources, everything you can into it. It is your single best investment because if young people get to the polls, uh, especially multiracial, multicultural. Uh, across the board, if young people come, you're going to get votes that you wouldn't get otherwise. And those people, those young people are disproportionately progressive. So uh, simple answer to Steve's question, but a great question from Steve. Oh, thank you so much for the question, Steve. Thank you for answering sage advice and will be taken up. And next up is Danette, as we do use a progressive stack here. 
And we have 11 people with hands raised, so let's try to keep the questions real succinct and try to go through them in a rapid way. I'm going, and I'll really promise to be fast. Thank you. I'll be fast. Uh, hi, John. Great to have you here again. Um, okay, I asked this question earlier, and please forgive my ignorance. Uh, if we, I think we're going to uh, retain the Senate, uh, we might lose the House. How are we going to get bills passed? Um, is is there a workaround, or um, how does that happen if we indeed yeah. lose control of the House? Thanks. It's a great question. The answer is it's not going to be easy. Uh, anybody who tells you that there's a, a workaround. Uh, you know, there, there are some workarounds, and I'll mention a couple quickly, but the reality is that the only way you're going to get things passed is with a huge level of organizing and pressure, um, and even that will be difficult because the Republicans are coming in are very resistant to it. Kevin McCarthy is going, he is a terrified man. He doesn't have the confidence of his position, so he is going to be very frightened by the Freedom Caucus and the right-wingers who are going to tell him if he does any movement toward the middle, any compromise with Biden or with Schumer, that he's out as, as leader. So with that situation, uh, it's going to be very hard to do things in the House. The one way you can do it is with what I refer to as a pulling motion. And that is that if you can get a majority of House members to sign on to bring a bill to the floor, they can actually do that. And because there are a handful of issues where you have a group of Republicans who are on the right side of those issues. You want to look at some of those. One of the key ones I always come back to is the PRO Act. The PRO Act got a it got all the Democratic, I think all but one of the Democratic votes, and it also got a pretty decent number of Republican votes. So there is a very good argument that if unions and their allies came on the PRO Act and started a petition there and said, we want to get over that 218, it's within the realm of possibility. You want to identify issues of that sort and pull them, right? Pull them to the floor get the votes. Uh, the painful reality is you're going to have to get a, hand, a handful of Republican votes to do it. But if you can get it out of the House with a more Democratic Senate, if Raphael Warnock wins, then you got some real possibilities to do things. Uh, thank you for that. And yes, it's a shame we lost Kinzinger and Cheney because they might have been drawn into supporting the John Lewis Voting Rights Act. And they, I they think now especially. Seat. Yeah. Yeah, it's unfortunate. Um, Jeffrey, you're up. Hey Jeff, can you hear me? Yep. Yes. The way you're first off, the way you were talking talking about all that, I think you, I think you should be head of the D, DNC, <laughs> DNC and all that. <laughs> first off, and secondly, that meant that bill, that oldest trick of the that oldest trick in the book. How could we not? How can they not fall for that? If you know what I mean. And thirdly, do you think balancing the budget would actually help out? Help out? You know, split the budget evenly with every candidate. Oh. You know what I mean. Oh, John, John, you got muted somehow. John Nichols got muted. I'm back in the game, I hope. Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear yes, you now. Yep. Hear you. So again, I'm going to try and do one minute answers here because we're really running out of time. Uh, very good question. And there, there's always that, that parody debate. I think when people get recruited to run for Congress by um, the Democratic Congressional Campaign Committee and by party leaders, there ought to be some sort of upfront commitment of resources there rather than leaving him in the lurch. Uh, because ultimately, one of the reasons candidates don't run a second time when they come close is because they feel so burned by the, the party establishment. And so there, I, I like actually what Jeffrey's suggesting there of, you know, I don't know, I would never recommend, frankly, pure parity, because look, there are some races that are, that are tougher races. There's some races that are easy, they don't need money. There are some races that do need more money. So it's not always an even thing, but there ought to be a baseline that everybody gets. And there, the key thing on this is there have got to be people who have more of a sensitivity to the whole of the country making these strategic decisions. The fact of the matter is the Democratic Party has, over the last 12 years, lost its uh, lost traditional labor left Democratic seats in northern Michigan, two, one in northern Minnesota, one in western Minnesota, in South Dakota, in North Dakota, and now on Tuesday in Western Wisconsin, they also lost one in Northern Wisconsin a few years back. So they, they keep losing seats that are in traditional, the traditional labor left seats. And the reason they're losing them is twofold. Number one, they don't get the resources in to the fights that they need to. And number two, they keep trying to nominate boring centrists when those are progressive populist areas. 
And so there really needs to be a rework there. And again, that this is a place where a group like PDA that's willing to go into primaries ought to be ought to be engaged because uh, the folks in Washington aren't always very good at figuring out who ought to run for a traditional progressive populist seat. And those, by the way, are the seats where Democrats are doing a frontline fight against the Trump Republicans, right? And the way to do that fight is not by going to the center. The way to do that fight is by going to a progressive populist standpoint for economic, social, racial justice, save the planet and promote peace. Thank you so much. The next person who I had on stack uh, took her hand down was Stella Fair. Stella, if you wanna come forward and ask a question, I'll ask you to unmute. If not, we're gonna go to Jim Carpenter. Stella, do you wanna ask a question? Uh, go ahead, Stella. Uh, no, then we'll go to, sorry about that, Stella, then we'll go to Jim. You're up, Jim. Okay, great, can you hear me? All right, yeah. so, so, uh, uh, so first of all, I wanna say uh, that President Biden and the Democratic Party are not more progressive um, and have not redeemed themselves on foreign policy. Um, no. So on Cuba, on Julian Assange, on the threat of a nuclear war, uh, they have not redeemed themselves. In fact, you can say that uh, General Mark Milley, chair of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, is more progressive than the Progressive Caucus, as you know, who sent a letter uh, about yeah. having um, a negotiated settlement in Ukraine and then took the letter back. So, John, can you say something about foreign policy and about how it can be more progressive on, on uh, and push for a negotiated settlement in the Ukraine war? Mm -hmm. Sure. Uh, look, it was a really difficult situation right before the uh, election when the Progressive Caucus put out, or 30, I think 30, 31 members of the Progressive Caucus initially put out and then withdrew a letter that was simply arguing for negotiations, right? And the weird part is we are doing negotiations. Um, there are actual negotiations occurring. So the letter wasn't a radical letter. It was actually a very, very mild, very moderate letter. And yet um, we couldn't even get to that. Um, and so there is a real problem in the Democratic Party mm -hmm. as regards discussions of foreign policy, and particularly as regards discussions of the Pentagon budget, which is overwhelming. Uh, one area to focus on is the good work that Barbara Lee and Mark Pocan are doing with their Pentagon Budget Reduction Caucus. Um, that's, that is kind of the base around which you can build some action there. But I think the other thing uh, to, to understand and to go to, to Jim's question is, there needs to be grassroots pressure on Democratic members of Congress so that they actually feel in their own districts that it's, uh, quote unquote, safe to stand up in favor of negotiations and in favor of peace. And the trouble is that that is not where, obviously, that's not where they, they tend to find themselves at this point. Now, this doesn't mean, this doesn't mean that everybody's going to be united on Ukraine, on on relations with Russia, on relations with China, on a host of other issues. There's a lot of real debates going on. This is an incredibly intense and tenuous moment globally. But what it does mean is that you've got to have a base within the Democratic Party of people who are in favor of reducing the Pentagon budget and who are in favor of negotiations rather than war. This is not a complicated thing. And yet um, it, it is clearly something that needs to be mission critical after this election, because what you saw coming into the election was evidence that um, that you just have a lot of very scared Democrats who are afraid to even you know begin to take a, a solid position uh, in favor of negotiations. And the last thing I'll tell you is, remember, again, the Biden administration is engaged in negotiations. So what the Progressive Caucus was asking for was not anything you know that was off the deep end. In fact, instead of instead of withdrawing the letter, they should they should ramp it up and say, you know, look. There are ways to get out of this crisis that that hold Putin and the Russians to account for what they have done, and also that get to some sort of peace in the Ukraine. In Ukraine, um, and ultimately, uh, I, I I despair a little bit at the lack of focus on negotiation and peacemaking. Uh, there needs to be a lot more work on that, and there are very few groupings within the Democratic Party that actually take this seriously. PDA historically has. And it ought to be a, a central uh, central focus going forward. Yeah, also, I'm glad, actually, Jim, I'm glad that Jim mentioned Julian Assange. That is a, a core uh, journalism issue. And the fact that uh, that 
uh, so many Democrats are cautious about talking about the Assange case is deeply troubling. Yeah, we um, we spoke out, of course, about the political yeah. prisoner situation, COP27 being held in Egypt and General Sisi's authoritarian regime there. We are planning, and Jim, I'll be in touch with you about this, of course, going forward, but I've been had a few of the old old line PDAers reach out to me and, and Jim and Marcy Winograd as the chairs of our foreign policy committee. We will probably be convening uh, an event around uh, the outline of a progressive foreign policy going forward in the coming weeks. Good. So thank you very much for that, John. And uh, up next that I have is C.B. Buckley, then Neil Penn. C.B., yep. you're up. Hey, C.B. Hello. Yeah, hi. Um, I appreciate your being here today. Um, I was wondering, uh, the candidate in Alaska, the Democratic candidate in Alaska was endorsed 100% by the unions in Alaska, ran on a pro-choice jobs and climate change mm -hmm. and all that. I was wondering what your impression is of uh, what's going on in Alaska and the fact that that uh, person is, um, the candidate there is obviously uh, <laughs> it's a very red state and is standing out and what that means for the rest of the country, if anything. Thank you. I'm so glad you asked that. Too. It's it, Look, Alaska is one of the great stories of this election. Uh, Mary Peltola, the Democrat who won the special election up there, beating Sarah Palin, looks to be in very good position to win the general election as well. Her percentages are great. Um, they do a ranked choice voting system there. The redistribution will almost certainly favor her uh, over Palin, who's running again. I think Mary Peltola is extremely likely to remain in Congress. That's one more seat for the Democrats, by the way. But it also is an incredible model uh, for, for politics going forward. Two things. One, voting systems matter. Alaska went to a ranked choice voting system or a top five or top four, I apologize. Um, that working on voting system, voting reform matters. Number two, um, you know, when you're in a traditionally red state, don't run boring, run interesting. And the fact is, Mary Peltola is a very interesting, very engaging candidate who reaches across all sorts of lines of partisanship and ideology, but has its deep, strong pro-labor, pro-choice stance, pro-environment stance. Um, and she's also a younger candidate. She is a, a native woman, uh, somebody who is, who is from the indigenous community of that state. Uh, and so everything that PDA has been talking about is actually happening there. And uh, and it looks, in my mind, it looks like a win. Uh, so thanks for bringing that up. I'm going to tell you, we've got about, you know, if I'm right with Alan, we've got about 10 minutes left. So, and we've got a lot of questions. So we may want to kind of group some of the questions so that we can make sure okay, we get. Let's go, let's go, let's go, Neil and Ilka. Let's go two at a time. And then we, we go to three after that. But Neil, you're up. John, it's always a pleasure to hear you speak. I'm definitely going to get a copy of your book, uh, Retaking you. the Soul of the Democratic Party. Uh, you've identified, as always, lots of nuances that move from surplus powerlessness to things like evoking young voters and a, a few other things. But to be succinct, uh, uh, you did a wonderful job on that. My main question is, while the PDA policies are excellent, uh, big surprise, everyone in the room knows this, the Democratic Party is hijacked by corporate Democrats. That's why Bernie was stolen. They stole the nomination from him twice. And even though for decades we've been doing pragmatic things, like when Dennis Kucinich was running, we knew he wouldn't win, but uh, the progressive community in San Francisco Bay reason, if we push for him, maybe it will move the dial on the Democratic uh, platform a little bit more towards the left. So the elephant in the room is how how are we going to challenge the fact that corporate Democrats are foxes guarding the chicken coop as reflected in when Obama had Wall Street bull Yep. Oh, um, Neil got muted uh, unintentionally, yep. but I think, um, uh, John, I think you probably got the gist of the question. Probably got the question. We're going to take a question from Ilka too, and then I'll, I'll Ilka, write them down so I can, I can deal with them. Thank you, Neil. That's a great question. Thanks, Neil. Ilka, you're up. Yeah, thank you so much. You brought up uh, a lot of amazing points as usual very much in admiration and lucky to be associated with PDACA and PDA. Um, 
and thank you for your time. Uh, I agree with you on Generation Z um, being actively voter contact. I have found them to be the most informed, amazing generation that I've come across. Um, one question that I have for you is regarding publicly funded races. What we had going on in California and probably many other states is actually Democrats paying money to Republicans that are centrist in order to attack mm -hmm. uh, quality candidates. Um, and we see that happening across the nation. Is that something we can uh, address uh, individually, statewide or nationwide? I mean, with the ability Mm -hmm. oh, thank you. Sorry, someone keeps cutting people off. It's not me. I don't support the staff cutting people off. Yeah, so don't please stop do that. doing that. But if people can keep their questions short, John, please. I, go ahead. I, I got Ilka's question. It was a great question. I very much appreciate it. Why don't we take two more questions? I'm writing them down and I'll I'll keep I will respond to each of these. I won't neglect anyone. Great union activist out in Arizona, Paul Stapleton Smith, take it away. John Nichols, thank you. Your work uh, here in Arizona has informed me as an organizer. I'm in the DNC now. You mentioned that uh, with the uh, the Protecting the Right to Organize Act. What can I do as a DNC member to to not only uh, get the PRO Act uh, uh, to be a front burner issue in the DNC, but of course can, it, it, would, it would lift up labor's electoral work. How can I best do that here in Tucson, Arizona? I will respond to that. I've got it. Let's take another one, and I'll we'll keep working our way through and getting we'll a list. Two more, because we have a we do have a special person to throw in there in a second. Here's Mimi. You're up, Mimi. Mimi Spreadbury. Hey, Mimi. Hi, John. Thank you so much for speaking. I've heard you speak before, um, the Bay Area. But um, it was mentioned in the chat. You know, um, gosh, we're running out of time. But what are your what what should we be telling uh, young folks in Florida and Texas who are just being killed by the red waves over there. Thank you so much, everyone, for organizing. I'm going to throw a fifth in because Gary Josephson is one of the people who is brave enough to stand up and run for Congress, get the Democratic nomination in an Ohio district west in, in suburban Columbus and southwest from there. And Gary, I believe, overperformed expectations on Tuesday night. Gary, take it away. Yes, I had 105,000. The opponent had 140. However, there was no Democratic endorsement. And when I'm part of this is Franklin Connie and the analysis that I've started, uh, which is not complete yet, looks like had I had the endorsement, that gap might have been totally gone. So mm -hmm. they gave it away, the Democrats. And for this needs more analysis. But on the uh, but it, you have to read Ohio different than every place that you've looked because the the. Uh, what can I say? The fascists have controlled the Republican Party and the Democrat. They've controlled the state for 10 years or more. Uh, and so it needs a different approach. And a coalition, uh, I don't think uh, going against corporate Democrats means anything because it, it, it stereotypes, because expanding industry sometimes is favorable to environmental, all these things. But I'm looking, for, I was looking when I started, I ran for the state chair two, uh, two years ago, and it had everything to do with what's going to, what was going to happen now, which is exactly what happened. The down, the down ballot candidates overwhelmingly were slammed. You need to reinvent even the name of the party. I mean, you can't do that, but you have to, maybe PDA is the vehicle, yeah. but whatever you need to rename and you need to have an uh, approach that the public sees is different because uh, I think that they're, the Dems are buried in infighting and could not help. And the result was that why did Ryan lose? Well, it'll, I, I hope to tune in in the future after the vote counts in and we should be talking about this more and do a strategy uh, which the Democrats do not have. Uh, and uh, two years from now, we got Mayor Sherrod Brown running. We have a presidential race, and you can't wait till then to put all these pieces in place. And that's what I'd want to do. Thanks Thank you so much, Gary. Okay, take um, it away, John, with all the answers. Uh, I tell you what. Why don't we take? I, why don't we keep rounding through people, and then I'll, I'll I'm writing them down so we can we might as well keep going because we've only got like about two minutes left here, so we're kind of. Sandy, yeah, Sandy you're up. Uh, Sandy, we do uh, progressive stack, so we go woman next. Sandy, you're up. Quick question. 
Um, in Georgia, all of the, the things that Greg Powell has talked about with the um, election challenges, the voter challenges, how did that affect the race? Anybody know? And um, is that going to affect the runoff too? Thanks. Got it. Okay. Right, John Seeley, 15 second question, John. What, do you want me, what's that? Oh, yeah. Oh, John, uh, John Seeley's uh, next? Yeah. Okay. You know, 15 I, seconds, I John. Speaking, thinking of 2004 or 24, when uh, we have uh, no pickups in the Senate available except the, and a lot to defend, and thinking that, you know, Ron DeSantis is probably a better candidate than Herschel Walker and probably a better candidate than Ron Johnson. Are it, it's very scary. I think he's asking about DeSantis as a stronger. Uh, John, you're, you're breaking up, which happens often with you. What, so I got I got that question, though. I got the okay. point. Yep. Maybe we finish with Donald Smith, who is our liaison up in Adam Smith's district in Washington. Oh, my gosh. Mike, uh, Mike and Dorothy and okay. Vicki, we're going to miss out on your questions. Donald, take okay. it away. Yeah, this is quick. So I mean, Jim already mentioned some of this, but the, the Republicans are now more anti-war than the Democrats. Um, the squad and Bernie Sanders all voted for funding Ukraine. And the, Biden is lying to the public when he says the war was unprovoked. The, the Russia's invasion was evil, but the U.S. is also evil for clearly provoking it. And so I'm just wondering, now they want war with China. Mm -hmm. that, that's my question. Thank, thank you. That's a good we got one. Just of it. Thank you. We Take it away, John Michaels. If if I tell you what, if Dorothy and Vicky can do it in a quick, like fifteen seconds, let's take them, and I'll get them on the list, and we'll we'll go through them all. Dorothy, you have ten seconds for a question for John. We'll sorry talk to, about sorry to do that to you. Later. Dorothy, go ahead. Ten seconds, Dorothy, my best friend. Dorothy, can't hear you. I am here. Dorothy, why don't we come back to you later? Because I know you want to give an update on the Bolero wetland. People around the country right now. What's that? We got it. We got it. She's at an event in support of the Bolero wetlands here in California. Oh, great! She will speak to the general general group in family time about that. So, Vicky, you have the final question. Vicky, am I? You're up. In Ohio, yes, their Supreme Court, okay, in Ohio, their Supreme Court outlawed their gerrymandering, but nobody enforced it. How, yep. What good are laws if we're not enforcing them? Got and it. Ohio would not have won except for the gerrymandering. All right. What a fantastic set, set of questions. I, I wanted to try and get everybody in and, and at least get as many as we could. So I'm going to run through these very quickly because uh, I know we're really in a tough uh, space as regards time. I was told we we're supposed to get done by 4:15, and we've already shot, you know, well beyond there. But um, so let's let's go one by one on what people ask. Uh, this the core challenge of corporate Democrats controlling the party. That is a fundamental reality. We've I, I think it underpins everything that we're talking about. It's why PDA exists, and PDA exists uh, as a challenge to that corporate power. But PDA has got to get better at it, and it's not to criticize the work you're doing. But there needs to be much more clarity on, on what is going on with the Democratic Party. And one of the things that I would suggest on that is do outreach to candidates across the country who got abandoned by the party, congressional candidates, other candidates, do outreach to them and say, hey, we'd like to pull you into PDA because this the party as it works now isn't working for the kind of politics you're doing. And so I think you've got one way to build the party out as a party with it's made up of people who recognize that they've been let down by this corporate structure. The other thing is run for party positions. I mean, be on the DNC if you can. And I love that we got somebody there. Be, take over these county parties, take it over and work it up from the grassroots because that won't give you the power. The people in DC are still gonna be uh, on the other side, but the more that you get you know, a place in this democratic party and can push back against that and actually object to it publicly, I think that matters. Um, so it's a little bit there. On public financing, look, and, and financing of elections, this is a huge deal. Uh, the 2022 campaign saw more billionaire power come into our politics than at any time in history. Bob McChesney and I wrote a book about a decade ago in, on a presidential election where we, we worked really hard to ascertain and detail that 10 billion had been spent. On this midterm election, 
it looks like they're going to be talking about 17 or 18 billion spent. So the amount of money that's flowing in is overwhelming. We've got to return to a deep commitment to campaign finance reform. Uh, the fact of the matter is campaign finance reform is treated too often as part of a list of democracy issues that we care about. And it's fine to have that list. I'm all for them all. But campaign finance reform has to move up to a much higher place on that list because the money power, the money power is owning our politics at this point. And the fact is, again, as I talked about Mandela Barnes, if he'd had parity on spending, he'd be a U.S. senator today. He got outspent by $10 million. And we see that in races across the country. So again, move that campaign finance up higher. On the PRO Act, um, you know, yes, the DNC ought to pass a resolution endorsing the PRO Act. Uh, and it ought to say that the PRO Act should be a priority for the lame duck session of Congress. The PRO Act has already passed the House. If it needs to pass again, that's fine. But the PRO Act has passed the House. We just got to get the Senate to move on it. And for our friends in Arizona, for our friends in West Virginia, this becomes a priority. We could pass and sign the PRO Act before this Congress is done. And I would hope that we could do it because it's absolutely vital to organizing and it's vital to politics. I wish I had another hour to talk about how important it is to empower unions so that unions then can be a counterbalance to corporate power. Um, dispirited young people in Florida and Texas, yes, um, it is absolutely vital to get out there and tell them that it does matter. Part of what we can do is amplify the fact that young people swung Senate races in, and House races and, and gubernatorial races in states across this country. In my state of Wisconsin, Tony Evers was reelected as governor because of youth turnout. Mandela Barnes almost won because of youth turnout. So I think, you know, one thing PDA could do is literally put together a primer on the power of youth turnout, right? And, and showing what it's done and then getting that message out via social media, TikTok using every vehicle to make that, to make that, that kind of uh, a renewal of the message that the youth vote is absolutely essential. And frankly, I favor talking about lowering the voting age to 16, uh, which Ayanna Presley has proposed in Congress. And I really like that. Um, uh, Gary, Stephan Gary from Ohio, thank you for what you did and do it again. And uh, contact me, I'll write about you. So we make sure that you get attention and maybe the Democrats will be embarrassed into paying attention to your campaign. Um, on the uh, Georgia voting rights issues, yes, I'm deeply concerned about it. Uh, runoff elections are often where there's more mischief, not less. And, and so I think the Republicans are going to be deeply committed to, you know, doing everything they can to win that, that Georgia race. It could get very messy and very ugly. Everybody should be on alert. Everybody should be uh, aware. And there should be a genuine effort to make sure that that is a free and fair election. Uh, we can't have people go soft just because the Senate is tied for Democrats, that Georgia race becomes really vital and the voting rights issues are essential. Um, uh, on the notion that re Republicans are more anti-war than Democrats, the fact of the matter is Republicans are raising questions about some of these issues. And the best, some of the best coalitions that have existed in Congress have been bipartisan coalitions on Yemen and on a host of other issues. And PDA is a group that ought to be delivering that message that if there are Republicans who are willing to work on these issues, there ought to be Democrats who are willing to talk to them. And it is about building coalitions. We have so many, I mean, Ukraine is overcovered. Not that it isn't important, I think it's important, but it's overcovered compared to the dozens of conflicts around the world in which the US is involved, including Yemen, which is way undercovered. And so I, there are potentials for bipartisan coalitions. Those ought to be emphasized. And that's actually one way, place where perhaps Democrats and progressive Democrats can have a real influence on making sure that what's done is done in an equitable and fair and responsible way that doesn't just you know, bow and kowtow to, to one side or to especially the military industrial complex. Um, and uh, let's see, the DeSantis issue, Ron DeSantis, I, I know people are scared, are frightened of him. They think he's going to be a stronger candidate than Trump and stuff like that. I, with all due respect, Trump is going to destroy DeSantis. Um, Trump, there's nothing Trump likes better than wrecking other Republicans. And Ron DeSantis is now the target of Donald Trump. And I want to tell you, Donald Trump is going to spend every bit of his energy over the next uh, two years uh, going after Ron DeSantis. And uh, it will be very interesting to watch.
But uh, my suspicion is that uh, those who write Donald Trump off uh, make a mistake. Too many of us have written him off too many times before. The fact is he remains the dominant figure in the Republican Party, as disastrous as he is. And our last question, I think our last question, on the issue of gerrymandering. The fact of the matter is gerrymandering is even more powerful than money. And we need to understand that, that the fight against gerrymandering, fight against extreme gerrymandering that makes elections non-competitive is the fight for democracy. PDA ought to be in the center of that fight. And the truth is that there's gonna be a great battle in my state of Wisconsin. Next spring, it, there will be a Supreme Court election. If the Democrats win the Supreme Court, not Democrats, but progressives win the Supreme Court, um, they will have a majority. If they have a majority, they can revisit the gerrymandered lines of the Wisconsin legislature and perhaps create free and fair elections in Wisconsin by 2024. So court elections matter. And it's absolutely vital to get people elected to the courts who are in favor of democracy and who draw, if they get in to the process of drawing the lines, that they do so in a way that makes elections free, fair, and competitive. Bottom line is that PDA should continue the work that it does on all these other areas, but PDA ought to have a strategy for focusing on the courts and focusing on uh, making sure that the people who are put into positions to decide how lines are drawn do so on behalf of democracy, not on behalf of politicians who just wanna choose their own voters. And so I can't em emphasize how important it is to make gerrymandering central to the work that you do. Now, I believe that in a matter of about an hour and a half, I have probably suggested 50 new assignments for you uh, and made Alan Minsky's life dramatically harder and made oh, all of your lives better. Yeah, better. but the fact, the fact is that uh, as Steve Cobble used to say, uh, if I had other groups that would do it, I wouldn't put so much on PDA. But the fact of the matter is you got one group that actually wants to do it, that wants to make this a equitable, fair, and small D democratic country that really does want economic and social and racial justice, that wants to save the planet and wants peace. That's PDA, that's why it exists. It's a very big, very tall order, but as Tim Carpenter taught me, as Steve Cobble taught me, as each and every one of you teach me on a regular basis, this is a group that can actually do it. You've succeeded so many times. I just want you to do about a thousand more things because we don't have that much time to wait for democracy to pull out So and to succeed. So thank you so much for having me. I am so honored to be with you and honored uh, by all the great work that you do. Thank you so much. And before you go, you should know one thing responding to your first answer of that whole string of questions that I think you don't know that PDA initiated the coordination between um, the progressive caucuses of the Democratic parties and the state parties across the country. Our next meeting is Wednesday. It is just the chairs of those caucuses or the vice chairs that we pull together and meet with once a quarter. Some will probably go back to once a month. Now we dropped it to once a quarter in the lead up to the midterms. It's a great initiative. We partner now with our revolution on that. And also, uh, but PDA has the name to sort of lead it and we did launch it. And so that's something we're doing. And it does channel a lot of the efforts you spoke about because it is about going into the Democratic Party, inviting people into the Democratic Party, building up those organizations and knowing where to reach them in each state. And uh, so we're very proud of that. But also John Nichols, I hope to see you in early March or mid-March, I believe in Wisconsin, which will be great. And um, and I just want to really end where you began, which is that um, together, John Nichols, um, the legacy of Steve Cobble is something that we will make sure we keep alive. And with your contributions, it will be kept alive brilliantly and uh, inform generations to come in American society and the world. So thank you so much, John Nichols, for joining us. Thank you. And it's refreshing to be with you folks. After all these days and all this incredible politics, it's great to be with people who actually believe that we can make this a dramatically better country and a dramatically better world. I appreciate you so much. Thanks for having me. Thank you so much. And I am gonna wrap up the recording because we'll go to family time. And so with that, I just wanna thank, of course, John Nichols, a national political uh, reporter for The Nation Magazine, author of innumerable books. And uh, uh, you know, just check out everything that John writes online. He has a new article up on The Nation um, about John Fetterman's coattails in uh, working class uh, enclaves across Pennsylvania. And uh, so folks, uh, we're gonna wrap up the recording. Thank you for joining us for the 144th 
uh, consecutive PDA Progressive Town Hall. And stay on, everybody, for PDA family time. Thank you. Um, Alan, one of the ladies in the chat wanted.